What's going on guys? This is Brian from Advancement Hockey Advising here. And today we have another interview here with Terrence Wallen. Now, for those of you who don't know who Terrence is, he played NCAA hockey for four years at UMass Lowell. And then from there, he played in multiple pro leagues in the SPHL, ECHL, a little bit in the AHL as well. And uh, with that career, he's, he gained a ton of experience. He knows what he's talking about when he talks about hockey. And from there, he moved on just recently and became a skills coach for the Maine Mariners in the ECHL and has been doing that since. So honestly, it's gonna be, I think we had a great conversation here. I think you guys are really gonna love it. So hopefully you guys get some value out of the video, take home messages and apply it to your lives as well. So without further ado here, let's dive right into the video with Terrence. All right, Terrence, glad to have you on board here for the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. This is exciting. Awesome. Well, I guess we can just dive right in with our first question here. So why don't you tell the audience and myself just a little bit about yourself and uh, your hockey slash coaching background? Yeah, so uh, I grew up right outside Philadelphia uh, in Yardley. I played most of my youth hockey in New Jersey. Obviously, I did like a lot of tournament teams. I did the USA uh, like festival programs and a lot of summer stuff like that. Went to LaSalle College High School, which is a really good a high school program in Philly. Uh, and then after that, uh, I was about 16 when I went to Gunnery, uh, the prep school. It's now the Frederick Gunn School, actually, in uh, Connecticut. Played three years there. Um, I absolutely loved it under Coach Baudo. Chris Baudo was unbelievable. He, he's kind of a, uh, I feel like he kind of jump started my hockey career. I had a great youth coach too, but Coach Baudo kind of, when you're at a prep school, you're living with them and you're, you're under their wing a little more. So uh, I credit a lot of my success to him. I played three years there, got a commitment from UMass Lowell my sophomore year at Gunnery. I repeated when I got there, so technically my junior year. Went, played four years at UMass Lowell, had a lot of success as a team, played with guys like Connor Hellebuck, Scott Wilson, who has two Stanley Cups, Chad Ruedel, Penguins, Joe Gambardella, who's played in Edmonton. Uh, we had some really good teams. Um, so it was fun to kind of go through that and see where guys have landed after. And then after UMass Lowell, I played a little bit in the SPHL, a little bit in the ECHL, mostly the ECHL, and then uh, had, a, had a couple cups of coffee in the AHL, which was uh, <laughs> really proud of. And uh, it was, it's honestly like a, a great achievement and I don't like to take it lightly because guys in professional hockey, they work their butts off and the, the ultimate goal is to make it to the highest level. And to me, the, the AHL was my NHL, honestly. So I'm really proud of that. And then, uh, obviously away from like my playing career, I've started, uh, evolution hockey camps up here in Maine. And I think that the, the name evolution comes from kind of my SPHL to AHL journey in, in a way. So I started that and then, uh, through COVID, I, I, was started doing all these zoom things from above my garage and one thing led to another and here I am and I have kind of my own youth program and I do skill development for them and uh, they're called the main evolution I got learn to play I got eight you all the way up to 18 you so it's, it's been really really rewarding on on my end and uh, that's kind of my hockey backstory, if you will. Awesome. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Why specifically do you think you, like, why did you choose to start Evolution Hockey? Why did you go into, you know, skills coaching and coaching in particular after your hockey career? I, I think part of me has always been a student of the game. I always love to, like, watch video. I love to, I'm always watching NHL games. Like, if anybody knows me, know Terrence Wall and hockey. Like hockey is like the first thing they think of, which is, which is normally the case for guys in hockey. But I just feel like it's always been it's always been who I am. And I came up to Maine. I asked for a trade after my third year. So that's about five years ago now. Um, and I, I just I figured I wanted to get back to the hockey community that's been so good to me for so long. And I went under a guy's wing on Massachusetts, uh, Eddie Hill. He runs Hill Hockey now. Uh, they're out in Arizona. I kind of went under his wing and kind of learned how to run skill skates. And I, I put my sort of spin on things and have my own little niches and different stuff like that. But I really wanted to start it because I, I, I care about kind of growing the game. I think that that's my biggest thing is growing the game. I, I, I'm a big culture guy. So I, I love to uh, have like, sm I love smiles on the ice. I don't love when kids slam sticks and stuff like that. So to me, it was kind of giving back and what I had as a kid, I, I want to give to the young kids coming up in the game now. Yeah, it's incredibly rewarding. I mean, I personally did a little bit of skill stuff and honestly, it was it was so, so fun to do helping kids get better. You know, there, there's, it's a really, really good feeling, honestly, giving back to and helping them out. Yeah, like for, for me, like when you're and I'm working with pro guys now, so it's funny. I work with like eight year olds. Yeah, I work with we got some 27 year olds. So it's like yeah. such a broad spectrum. So it's nice to 
be able to teach, but like, I teach an eight-year-old something. He gets it. I love it. Like when I see him like under grasp that concept, it's really rewarding for me. And then at the same time, I got 27-year-olds, 22-year-olds, 25-year-olds. I teach them something and they get it and it's rewarding for me. So like all the way up the ladder, it's just, it's rewarding to see guys really grasp on the concepts and be coachable, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. So kind of, you know, on another note here, what like talking about, you know, teaching kids, you know, some skills and all that stuff. What's like, I would say maybe the, the most important skills for kids to really learn when they're, you know, when they're growing up, when they're playing, what do you think are like the top three skills they should focus on? I, I think in a broad aspect, skating is obviously the, is the number one thing you look at guys in the NHL and there's not a guy in the league that can't skate anymore. And mm-hmm. 20 years ago, you could get away with kind of being that like fighter, like yeah. that's all you do. And now like you, you look at guys like Ryan Reeves and guys, who are, who are the fighters of today's age and they, they can play like these yeah. guys can absolutely rip pucks and uh, they have skills. And like, if it's a different time and age now where you got to be able to skate, you got to be able to lengthen your stride and uh, you need to be evasive. You need to be able to cut back in corners. You need uh, like, so being, I think being like a versatile skater is probably number one. You need yeah. to, be able to open your hips and uh, turn on a dime and uh, really have that explosive first three strides. And I think probably that, in and of itself is probably the number one thing that I would talk about is, is skating. Number two, I would probably go with game IQ. Uh, I think that there's a lot of skills coaches out there that teach the teach just kind of like, uh, like puck handling through obstacles mm-hmm. and like, that's going to get our kids good with their reps, but like, are they really understanding the game? Because when it's all said and done, these kids want to play games. They don't want to stick handle through like obstacles and go around cones and, so like for me is, is like understanding pressure and understanding the game of hockey. I always tell kids like in my youth program, like you want to be good at hockey, you got to watch hockey. You got to like, like you need to not just like going to the rink like twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday and doing that hour practice that you're going to, you're going to magically be Wayne Gretzky or Connor McDavid. You know, it's, there's more to it and you got to learn the game. And I would think that that's my number two and number three is, I mean, this isn't like a skill, but it kind of is as being coachable. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I think like, like through your reps and through everything, like most people would say like, you got to be good at, with the puck and good at stick handling, good at shooting. But I think within that is more importantly, and like on a higher level is being coachable and not like taking everything as a criticism. Like there's people in hockey who really want to help you and they're going to help you. Um, but if you don't listen to them and like, if you're not able to be taught how to stick handle or able to be taught how to shoot, I don't know that you're going to kind of climb the ladder as much as you would like to. And so, so I think it comes down to skating game IQ and being coachable that kind of help you climb the ladder as you wish. Honestly, that's three great points. I totally agree with, Um, you know, the skating part, like you said, no player in the NHL now can't skate. It's just a must. You need to dial down your skating. It has to be one of your fortes, you know, Uh, that's really what helps you get to the next level. You know, the coachability, totally agree with that. You know, kids that aren't coachable, they typically don't, you know, make it very far. So uh, I would say coachability, hundred percent. That's just a good skill to have in life, honestly. So, Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Hockey IQ. And a lot of people, I think there's this misnomer out there where hockey IQ is just like you have it or you don't. I think there is a little bit of truth to that, but I think you can definitely learn a lot by watching the game, watching oh, people yeah. that are better than you. I think you can learn so much about that and doing, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, some drills that are more um, like kind of setting the, the game scenario drills, you know, if you will. I think that, yep. that really helps you out with hockey IQ. So yeah, three great points that I totally agree with. Um, off ice, do you have like any, you said coachability, but is there any other things that uh, players should kind of focus on off the ice? Uh, like away from hockey, I think that one thing that I, that I was really bad at that I got really good at is like your, your mental health within the game of hockey. Hmm. Like for me, when I was at Lowell, I was a head case. Like I was all about superstitions. I was, I always had to put my left stuff on first. I always had to have a Kit Kat before the game started. And like you, you get caught up in that where it's like, Oh my God, I didn't eat my Kit Kat. Like I'm going <laughs> to awful in the first I know, period. I know the feeling. And, and, you, and you just yeah. get, you get caught in these waves and it's so like not stupid because it works for some people. But like, for me, it's just like, 
consumed me. And as, as I got into pro and I got out of that college atmosphere where it was almost more like business, like, like when I was at college, it felt like business. Mm-hmm. And then I got to pro and I realized like, man, I'm, I'm playing 72 games. I'm practicing all the time. Like this is a mental grind. Like I gotta, I gotta calm down and worry about like my life. Like there's a social aspect to hockey uh, that some people don't realize. Like I had a girlfriend who's now my wife and like, you gotta worry about that too. Like you gotta yeah. worry about your family. You gotta worry about a lot of different things. So like almost, and I've said this in a couple of different like podcasts and things that I've, I've talked on. It sounds bad, but you almost got to find a way to like care less a little. Uh, like you can't let the, the game of hockey just completely consume you or I it's it's, it's going to drown you. And um, unfortunately in college, I think it did drown me a little. But as I got older, I think I got really good at understanding like, hey, like you got to take some mental time too. like you got to chill out, you got to relax. Like hopefully everybody out there listening is 21. Like you got to go have like a beer or two with the guys. Yeah. As I got older, like I started to realize that, and I think it helped me calm down, and it almost made me play better hockey. Yeah, no, I, t- I totally agree with that point, and it's something that you know, there's a lot you know that you see out there. It's like, oh, work harder, work more, do this, do that, like be obsessing. To a certain point, yes, you need to be really passionate and dialed in with certain things, but you also have to pay attention to other things in your life, you know hockey is not the only thing that that encompasses your life you know your your health your mental health you know uh, your relationships all that that's very important as well so i completely agree with you that being completely consumed by something typically isn't healthy how yeah, and uh, it, oh no it, go ahead it's, go it's ahead. super like sorry to cut you off but I, like it's all it almost sounds like it's two different sides of the spectrum but for me it's like when i'm in the locker room like my head coach bangite our our door is always open so like guys can come in and talk to us. So like when, when we're in the room and like, it's like guys come in for practice and they're rolling out and stretching and having breakfast and having their coffee, like come in and talk to us. Like we love a loose room, like a good culture, I think starts with like a smile when you come into the rink Yeah. and when it's time to work, like you got to dial in. And I think that that's something you just said is like, you can't be completely consumed. Like there's a time and a place to, to dial in and yeah. then time and place to like, realize like like these guys are playing pro hockey i'm coaching pro hockey like how fortunate am i like but then when you get onto the ice like you gotta realize like it's work time yeah no 100 percent. now how how do you go about getting dialed in and in the zone for when you go on the ice and then once you're you're done doing the work and stuff how do you kind of dial back you know and focus on other things what's like your process with that as a coach or as a player uh, how about both okay um as a player I actually, when I played in Peoria, which is out in Illinois, uh, Ben Zobrist came in. Uh, he won the World Series with the Chicago Cubs that year. He came into our locker room one night and he talked about how Joe Madden, uh, their manager, he talked like their whole like uh, identity that year was the 30 minute rule. And that was after a game, whether you played like absolute garbage or you played the best game of your life, you take 30 minutes. You sit down, you think about it, you uh, maybe, maybe you focus on it hard for 30 minutes. Like, man, why'd I make that play? Like, what can I do better? Uh, Like allow yourself to overthink for 30 minutes, but then after that 30 minutes, kind of let it go. And Mm. like, like I just said, like, go about your life, and uh, live your life and uh, take care of family, take care of uh, other things away, go read, like forget about the game for a little bit. And I think that in my pro career, I wish I had that my, my freshman year of college because I think it would have really benefited me. Um, but in my pro career, I think that that 30-minute rule really uh, took hold of, like, how I approach the game as a pro. And then as a coach, I, you dial in much differently. It's more like uh, preparation. So, like, we'll, we'll sit down. We'll, we'll come in. We'll have our 8-15 meeting. Uh, we'll, we'll go over practice, like, uh, go over some game film. But – it's more just preparation. And then when you get on out on the ice, your preparation kind of takes care of itself. Uh, like if you have a good practice plan and you're working on things that you need to work on, I think that that preparation speaks for itself. And these guys go do the drills. Uh, so you, you obviously prepare differently as a coach. Yeah. But when I'm doing skill development, um, I think a, a good trait to have as a skill development guy is to understand each player. Like if, if I'm dialing in on like a, like a shooting clinic, I'm, obviously dialing on, on like, where's his hand placement? Like, where's his flex? Like, 
Is he, is he getting his chest over the puck? Where is feet position? So you dial in in different ways as a skilled coach too. Yeah. No, I think I, what I'm getting at uh, from like your process is that you've learned how to really dial in and focus on like the task at hand. And then you're good at like, once it's done, you're good at like analyzing it for a little bit and then switching to the next thing that has to be done. Right. I right. think it's a great skill for players to have for sure. Yeah. It's hard to do, honestly. Well, it is. Like, I and I'm not say- <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying like uh, I've mastered it, but I, I got pretty good at it and good enough where I think it helped me be successful. And I've kind of ran with it. And uh, again, it's, it's not easy. Like me- and the mental health stuff is coming out more and more. Right. Um, so I, I think that it's a, good time to talk about it. Like it's good time to re like you want it. Like, obviously you work, I work so hard on uh, playing for so long. Like you're going to, you care, obviously, like you're going to care. Like if you played like crap, like, yeah, it takes a little bit of a toll on you. So it's hard to kind of budget your time into 30 minutes of thinking about it. Yeah, for sure. But it's a good tool. 30 minutes. I I've never heard of that rule before. And I think I'm going to start using it because yeah, I, I 30, love it. It's yeah. paid dividends for me. Yeah. 30 minutes to really focus down and think about what happened. And then you're done. You move on to the next thing. Probably easier said than done, but a, a yeah. great rule. I think uh, players could take away from this for sure. So what are some other things like uh, on the mental health side of things? So you, you mentioned, you know, dialing in and kind of learning how to dial out, managing your focus in a way. What are some other things that players should really focus on to really keep your mental health up as a hockey player? I think having like a good, like good preparation helps a lot. Mm-hmm. Superstitions and routines are really different to me. Yeah, like a Superstition takes, takes over, but a routine kind of gets you set. Like, like I would always get to the game two and a half hours before the game. I could tell you like my minute by minute, thing as I led up to a game, like I would sit down, I would come in, I would get my, my hoodie, my, my gitch, I would have my coffee, I would put a hot pack on, I would get my treatment. And then we would go through like our power play meetings, our PK meetings, uh, our team meeting. And then you like, after those meetings, it's like, okay, like I'm going to warm up. I'm going to start to get dressed. I'm going to like relax for two minutes. I kind of visualize the game. And then for me, it was, I say a prayer before each period. And then I go about my business and you, you just like dial in. And there's some nights in pro where you're playing like a Wednesday night game and like there's a thousand, 1200 fans out there. And it's like, oh man, this is, this is pretty dead, but you got to like manufacture your own energy. And like the guys that can dial in and like perform on those nights where it's hard to perform. Those are the guys that continue to climb the ladder. So like we, we use the saying here, embrace the suck. So like when, when stuff starts to hit the fan, like if you can, if you can dial in mentally, and this is hard, like when stuff starts to hit the fan, if you can like come out of it with a positive mind frame uh, and realize that like brighter things are ahead and like good things are going to happen. If you just stay on the process, uh, I think that that's really beneficial for kids growing up. Like if you get cut from a team, it, it sucks. Like your heart and like you put all this work in, but if you can like mentally get to a place where you're like, I'm going to allow myself to work through this. Like, I think that that's really beneficial to kids. Like, again, it goes back to the 30 minute thing. Like you get cut from a team, think about it for 30 minutes, maybe, maybe a little longer. That's a big event. If you get cut from a, from a team, you get cut from a team. Like it's, that's brutal, but like, I'm going to work through this. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of put my foot on the gas. I'm going to go to work. Uh, rather than being like, oh, I got cut from the team, like, and then your your momentum, your attitude is go, like going straight down, and yeah, uh, it's again easier said than done, but I think that a lot of this stuff helps. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're talking like adversity is is the biggest thing here, and and I think being able to deal with adversity in a good way is probably one of the biggest life skills and hockey skills, and one of the biggest things that you can can have in life that'll serve you. You know. I think being able, if you get cut from a team, it's, it's tough. I have been cut a bunch of times, never gets easier, honestly, but it's, it's, yep. it's hard, but if you can get through it, you know, you can go through the period of feeling bad for a little bit, but once you're past that period, reframe it in a way where, you know, it's like, Hey, I got cut it means I need to work on this and this and this, and then I'm going to do my best to, you know, make the next team and so on. You know, if, if sure. you can th- go ahead. And I think adversity, I think adversity is like a necessity. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I think you need it in some aspect, like to me till age 19, 
in my hockey career, I had very little adversity. And then sophomore year in college, like I started to uh, kind of fall down the depth chart because I wasn't the coach's recruit. It's guys were coming in. Uh, I get it now more being a coach. Like I get it. But for me, like not playing a lot, like to me, that's like, that's adversity. And like, I probably wasn't mentally ready to go through that. But now 10 years later, like it served me so well because I kind of gutted my way through it. Yeah. Uh, I think in some aspect, like you need a little adversity. So you, you know, that there's something to overcome. Yeah, definitely. It makes you stronger, you know? I yeah, think for sure. It's so, so important. What are, what are things you did to, to kind of push through that adversity in the moment? Uh, that was tough. It was definitely a grind uh, mentally. I think at some point my sophomore year, I said to my parents, like, I don't even, I don't want to play hockey anymore. My dad, well, my dad's like my biggest fan. Um, my brothers are my biggest fans and they kind of help guide me through. And it's important to have people you can lean on in your life. I think, I, I think in some aspect, like I, I stayed there because we were, we were really good. And like it, part of me in my mind was like, all right, like I'm not playing, but I'm not playing at the number three school in the nation. Like we're ranked in the top 10, like almost every week. And if yeah. I'm playing on a good team, like, do I want to go play for a bad team? Like, what do I want out of this? And like, I don't know, part of me, I'm sometimes I'm like almost loyal to a fault. Uh, so that was, that was definitely part of it. Like I wanted to stay and kind of be with these guys and kind of go through the process together, but it was hard. That was hard. Uh, I can't say that I can like point to one specific thing that got me through, but yeah. it was difficult, but I'm, I'm happy that I did go through it. Yeah. Oftentimes it's hard to point at something. Sometimes it's just like a gut feeling you fall. It's like, Hey, like I want to, you know, stay and kind of go through this. I, I want to, you know, be a part of it and all that stuff. And having the, the support system, like you mentioned, so huge. Like me too, multiple times in my career, I was like, I got cut or I wasn't playing or anything like that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking about quitting. I, I was contemplating it. And oftentimes it was a conversation with my dad, conversation with some close friends, you know, that really, you know, helped me kind of stick with it. And I'm, I'm happy now that I did because it, it just yeah, helps makes me. you stronger. Yeah. Hundred percent. So I think that that's huge. I think it's something like if again, if players can just learn to push through adversity and come come out on the other side, you know, you will achieve success eventually, and it'll serve you in the future. It's hard to see when you're going through it. Oh, it is. It is. It's very difficult. It's very hard. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. call it adversity for a reason, right? Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not supposed to be easy. But uh, all right. So kind of moving away from adversity here, I kind of want to touch on leadership a little bit. So what? What's a leader in your mind? That's such a hard thing to like pinpoint. Yeah. <laughs> Being leaders, like, I mean, obviously having the ability to lead. So like what, what makes people follow you? Yeah. And to me, that's like having like, I think like if you go through like my evolution hockey stuff, like a big thing with me is, and like almost has become like a motto is effort and attitude. And I think those are two things that you can control day in and day out. Like when you, when you get up in the morning, you control, am I in a good mood or, or am I in a bad mood? And what am I going to do today to make myself better? Then that's your effort. So I think like to a certain extent, leaders have that on a consistent basis and uh, like having a good effort and a good attitude starts to form a leader. But I think first and foremost, like a leader is just a good person. Yeah. Um, like you have good core values. Um, you care about others around you. You want you you want to bring other people into the fire. You you want to go to war with these people behind you, and they want to go to war with you, leading them. Like they they're willing to go into the fire with you. Um, so it's almost having like that uh, persuasive is the wrong word, but having like that uh, ability to draw people in, um, almost like a magnetic positivity. Maybe like influence, you know, influence. yeah, yeah, yeah. Having like good influence on people and like, and, and then like taking it a step further, like, like, what are your habits? Like, like if I'm saying like, guys, like we got to work out, we got to get pucks to the net. Like if, if I'm not doing that, how are, how are the guys that I'm leading uh, supposed to be expected to do that? And uh, kind of practicing what you preach in a way. Yeah, for sure. Leading by example, man. It's so, it, yeah. it, I think that's the, the best kind of leader, in my opinion. Yeah. People, like, cause talk, talk is cheap. If you're, like you said, if you're, you say, Hey guys, we got to work out and you're not working out and you're getting out of shape. Like 
they're not going to follow you. You know, it's, yeah. it's plain and simple. You have to lead by example. Absolutely. There's so many different types of leaders too. Oh yeah, there is. There is. I think of some of the captains that I've had. And for me personally, like, I think I'm more of like a, like a f- firm talkative leader. And then there's some guys who just like are quiet and go about their business and they don't have to say much. And you just know, like, you know, what you're going to get out of him. Yeah. Like, Oh, that he's going to, he's going to be in the gym every day. He's going to be first guy on the ice. He's going to, he's not going to complain when a, when a practice is hard, he's going to go through the practice. He's going to work. Like there's just so many different types of leaders. With, and that that's why it's so hard to pinpoint, right? It is. It is. It's true. There's different types. There's guys that have that, that energy. They can just talk and they can just lead the team in that way. Other guys are quiet, but they go by example. Kind of Connor McDavid kind of comes up to mind. You know, he's not the biggest talker, but he just leads by example and people want to follow him. Right. I think, like you said, it comes down to uh, do, do people follow that guy? You can, you can kind of, you can actually tell if you're just in a room with, with different players and stuff. After a while, you can kind of see who the leader is just by, yep. you know, if people follow the example and, and just follow them. Uh, and yeah, so, absolutely. So, Kind of, I got one last question for you. I, I think we can finish off on this one here is what's like your last piece of advice that you want to give to young players out there kind of going uh, through the journey and that want to play, let's say college hockey one day, pro hockey one day, what's your last piece of advice for them? I kind of think that like a lot of the stuff that we talked about in the previous, however long, 20, 30 minutes, it kind of like all kind of comes to a head like the 30 minute, like you need to have a good hat on your shoulders. You need, like I'll kind of describe it in this way, like have fun with it. Yeah. It's going to be small bumps. There's going to be big bumps and you gotta, you gotta find a way to kind of roll with the bumps. You can't just run into them. Uh, you gotta be able to roll with the punches sometimes and uh, like laugh at yourself at times. And you gotta have fun. You gotta, you ha- need to have fun working. You need to have fun uh, in the bad times. You need to have fun in the good times so to me it's like having fun honestly it sounds like almost too lighthearted and and too cliche but like I look back at my career and it, like I had so much fun like it was just a block like I got to play pro hockey for five years and now I'm coaching the main Mariners like how like how fun is that like yeah. I'm stuck behind a like in a cubicle nine to five like I get to come to the rink every day and drop a practice plan and go out on the ice with 25 great guys. And like, I think being grateful and having fun. And I think it all kind of comes to that. And I could, I could say a million things on what makes like a good hockey player, but I think in the end, like you're playing a sport and you got to realize that. Yeah, for sure. I think enjoying the process, like you said, it's, it's so important. I talk about it with my guys all the time. It's like hockey doesn't last forever and it's, it's something for sure you have to enjoy. It's such a fun process. And yeah, there's like bumps that come along the way, like you said, but you know, you got to learn how to roll with them and uh, just, you know, have fun and enjoy it while you're in the moment. Cause it is, it is a blast. It's the best years I've had for sure. So yeah, it's unbelievable. And, and another thing, like you guys like represent players and like, I think an important thing for like, for kids kind of going through, like you, you said, it's like 15 to 20, your kids normally are and, like, for those for those ages, I, I do like a little mentorship program with some kids. And my thing is like, uh, be process driven, not results driven. Mm. And I think that that's a very big deal too. Like it's hard to realize in those 15 to 20 years, you're, you're like waiting for your commitment. You're waiting for that next best thing. Um, but you need to realize that this is a process. This is a journey. And like stuff's not going to happen overnight. And like, don't, don't worry about the results. If, if the process is good, the result will take care of itself. hundred percent. It's all about the small little habits that you have each and every day, the small goals and that by doing that consistently, I think that's when you achieve the larger goals. So, but if you focus on the process, not only do the results usually come, but you just enjoy yourself more throughout the yeah, year. Yeah. It goes back to having fun, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that's a great note to, to end it on. So Terrence, thanks again for your time. Thank you so much for coming. This was a blast. And uh, hopefully, you know, you can come again one day and we can uh, chat further. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This was a blast. All right. Thank you so much. 
All right, guys, that is it for the video. We hope you got some value out of it. If you enjoyed the video, if you liked it by any means, feel free to absolutely destroy that like button. And if you're new here, if you haven't already, if you like what you saw and you want to see more of that kind of content, consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell so you never miss another video moving forward. Also, throughout the video, if you had any questions, anything you want to talk to us about, anything at all, if you want to talk to Terrence about something, anything, if you have any questions for any of us, feel free to drop a comment down below or send us an email at info at ahadvising.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. All right, guys, that is it. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video and we'll catch you on that next one.